Welcome to Navigating Change, the podcast from Tybel Inc. I'm Pete Wright, and I'm here with Howard Tybel. Howard? Pete Wright! Hey! You know, I always, you know, to me, this is the best part of the podcast, where we just sort of say hello to each other, and we have this unbridled enthusiasm, and then the podcast, hap- podcast happens, and we just sort of dive into getting very serious. Is that what, is that what, you think we're too serious? No, can... actually, I think I am. I think, and that's why you're so great because you keep <laughs> light. You're you're the man. All right. Well, we are we're going to talk about. Uh, you were inspired. Uh, inspired. Uh, inspired by direct mail. How exciting is that as a tease? <laughs> nice. uh, and so we're going to be talking all about this direct mail uh, piece today. But before we do that, you should head over to uh, tybelink.com and you can get, get a little bit more information about this show and and the, the charm that is uh, Howard Tybel and the humor and, Pete, right? and the no, enthusiasm. You know. Stop it, Pete. Stop it. <laughs> you can join our mailing list. Just click the blue button and you'll get updates whenever we post new episodes. And, of course, join the conversation on Twitter at Howard Teibel uh, or find Teibel Inc. on LinkedIn. We'd love to hear from you. You are going to be uh, doing another deep dive session. A very uh, this is These are, the I think, really the uh, where the rubber meets the road, these deep dives at NBOA, uh, the National Business Officers Association, uh, in February, February 21st through 24th in Los Angeles, City of Angels. You can find out more information about the conference at nboaannualmeeting.org, and you should do that. Now, the inspiration, the direct mail inspiration that I mentioned at the start of the show, this is the NBOA publication Net Assets, and the cover of Net Assets this month says, says this, Who's coming to school? Enrollment management, financial aid, and achieving the right balance of growth, diversity, and financial sustainability. And my Skype rings, and the camera comes on, and there I see, not Howard, but this magazine held up in your white-knuckled fist, saying, this is something we have been talking about too much to ignore. Tell me about your reaction to this uh, this particular cover, Howard. Oh, God. You know, you always set me up with the big, with the big question, with the really interesting... Big question. And I'll tell you something. This is a big question. This is the right question that they are posing front and center. And what is on every business officer's mind day and night is is that striking that right balance in this question around enrollment management, financial aid, and trying to focus on diversity and fiscal sustainability. You know, what's interesting about this is this reminds me of – in some ways, this quote I heard years ago, problems can be solved while dilemmas need to be managed. This is not a problem. This is a dilemma that is never going away, which is finding equilibrium in this conversation. I think there is continuous dis disequilibrium in this conversation around these topics as we get better at understanding not only who we are in our institution, enrollment management, how do we how do we navigate that? Half the battle with enrollment management I have found in talking with leaders in those areas is execution, not con- not the concept, but how do we actually execute on the ground around that? But that applies too to our financial aid policies as well as thinking about diversity. All of these things are interrelated. And as you and I know, we just recently did a podcast on this very topic that relates to the interrelationships between these key areas. So, I, think, I think this is really important. And, it, you know, it's funny to me. I, we went back. Uh, I, I was searching our archives. And the very first time we talked about NBOA, it was a conversation on complexity. I think what you're talking about, this idea of equilibrium, disequilibrium, is really important, that, it, it, that we will never reach equilibrium on these things. Or when we do, it's very difficult to sustain because these interrelated issues are so complex. Yeah. Uh, and, and because we're dealing with human organisms and human organisms are complex creatures with complex needs and students are complex and their families are complex. Right. And well, let's and get down so to some brush tacks Yeah, here. let's talk first about uh, about uh, this this idea of budget as it relates to tuition yeah. and financial aid because I think that's that's one of the key constituent components of this idea of financial sustainability. You know, the the as long as I've been in this field of helping institutions, both independent schools and hired institutions, navigate change, the thing that is strikingly sim- similar in both 
uh, industries, higher ed and independent schools, is that what often drives our activities, our thinking, our actions is what we call the budget cycle. And what's fascinating about the budget cycle, it is let's get through the next budget period. And when we can present a balanced budget to our board and we can get them to sign it off, then we can get back to work. You know, when we and what's interesting about this is Another framework that ties directly to this budget cycle conversation is the difference between structural change and temporary change. You know, we have levers as business officers that we can pull to balance the budget, whether in, in, in some cases doing things like drawing temporarily off of our endowment a little more this year or making some minor tweaks, but do things that don't cause dismay and significant disruption. The, the thing we dance around is what does it mean to have a structural change? And what does that mean? Yeah, right, exactly. If every year we find ourselves behind the eight ball and not bringing in enough revenue by whatever those different revenue drivers are to – give us some net positive, we, we, we've developed, in a sense, a habit of thinking short term. And when you're, when you're asked to think structurally, what you're basically saying is, how can we put in a change that allows us to not have to revisit these things over and over again? So a structural change could be, and these are big, though. This is, what's, this is why we don't focus on them, because they require bigger decisions. How do we think about how we use our facilities. Uh, rather than having a linear, this building is being used for this, this building is used for this function, you know, we've got residents, uh, we've got dorms here, we've got, um, we've got classrooms here. There's more and more thinking about much more creative uses of our existing structures. And maybe we don't need to uh, build new structures. I'm working with a school right now that's saying, you know what, we're going to repurpose our existing structures because we have to get out of this cycle of putting more and more physical structures in place that's only going to increase the depreciation issues that we have as well as having to uh, refurbish buildings over time. So this is an example of we get ourselves into a perpetual cycle of not really addressing underlying issues. I, I love that idea too because that one, that one in particular, this idea of multi-use repurposed space, it's sort of a, it sort of vibes off of a, a, a European model where space is at a constraint. If we operate where space is at a constraint, what are the new decisions, the the unintended sort of outcomes that uh, we may be able to leverage? I think that's a that's just one way of thinking about these things. And somebody in your organization needs to be raising these structural issues front and center for the senior team. When I say somebody needs to be paying closer attention to this, it is most likely the chief business officer who, who whose job is to both be paying attention to the, the strategic initiatives as well as their financial impact. So one concept I would like to see more and more is that we're getting out of these budget cycle conversations and we're asking ourselves what kinds of underlying structural changes would allow us to not have to every year uh, revisit the same conversation about how do we offset this particular program or service or initiative that loses money we need to find a way to have those conversations, even if we don't have a solution to them, but put them, put them front and center. And that's, that's, I think, the job of the business officer. You can't wait for the head to identify them, in a sense, have them teed up so that when the, the, the opportunity arises, you can raise them. They're, they're conversations we are equipped to have. Which leads us then to another focus that I think some schools do better than others is to recognize your strategic plan needs an underlying strategic financial plan that drives what initiatives we can focus on. Often we're playing this game of Catch-22. We're waiting for somebody else to define uh, whether it's the board, whether it's the, the, uh, the head of the school. 
where are we going? And therefore, then what I will do in response to that is put together a plan that speaks to that. I think a much more powerful and proactive way of thinking about this is let's put all the levers that impact where we want to go, enrollment, endowment, financial aid, uh, capital expenditures, and put it into a model that allows us to impact those different levers and then use that as a way to say, Let's have a best case scenario for our strategic financial plan. What would that look like? And you can use that as a driver for the bigger conversations, not to limit what you can do, but to understand the underlying financial, the, the underlying financial uh, structure that would that you can build off of. And I and I think that in some cases we do a good job of having that. In other cases. We're, we're more in reactive mode as business officers. You know, one of the things that you have, have talked about, to me at least recently, is this idea of organizations that are doing this really well by functioning as, in, in sort of startup mode to build these projections based on best case but operate based on existing case. Can you talk a little bit about that and how that might, uh, that might sort of support these initiatives toward uh, sustainability? Well, I was working with this. I mean, I was working with an independent school, and one of the business officers reflected that when she joined the school twenty years earlier, that it truly was all hands on deck. And over time, you know, if you think about the trajectory of having more means, uh, the 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 influx of more and more students through the baby boomers having kids growing up, and all of a sudden we started having greater enrollment and capacity. So we had our budgets increase to accommodate that. And now we've got structures in place that are that we can't afford. So in talking with the school, they were like, you know, the model that we're doing is we're going to, and this was just an example, we're going to increase enrollment by X number of students and we are not going to change the budget. We are going to operate from the same budget, which means that we're, we're going to work as if we worked 20 years ago, that we're going to build a culture of all hands on deck. And, and, and it's not that we have gotten lazy. It's not that. I think we've gotten accustomed to a certain way of working in silos that makes it more difficult for us to think about ourselves as a startup. Now, what's fascinating for me is independent schools, unlike higher ed institutions, there is a mindset of all hands on deck mm -hmm. in that you, you'll find that the, the, the business officer is not only teaching, they're, they're letting kids on the bus and taking kids off the bus. They're doing every job out there. It's, it's a very collaborative uh sort of more non-siloed than higher ed. But I can tell you in talking to a few, if you reflect back on what it was like in the earlier days when your school was young, there was a mindset even more of we can do even more uh, in our roles. And all I'm saying is one of the mindset shifts we might want to think about is if we're going to increase revenue, how do we do this without burdening ourselves with making our budgets uh, sort of equally high to accommodate that. Have them have your budgets be lagging behind, and this is a risk. I mean, this is why we don't do it. Is that we want to make sure we've got capacity. If we're going to have more students, we need more people to cover those students. But I'm saying is, err on the side first of having your budgets be a little less than what you think you need, and set a culture of having your 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 staff and faculty step up. Uh, to accommodate that. This is one way to think about financial sustainability. It's going back to an early time, maybe when your school first started. And I think this is this is one thing to to consider as leaders of your institution. And, and I don't think we're talking about full-on austerity measures here, but I think using this as sort of leading indicators to uncover where yeah. the the real uh, you know revenue uh, opportunities are. Exactly, because it—that's exactly right. Because if 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 
if we go if we increase every budget because we have now got these additional revenue sources, whether it's uh, through alternative revenue sources, uh, building a campus in a different part of the country or a different part of the world, if if we increase our budget across these different areas, we won't – some of these will be sustainable, but some of these won't. We have to be willing to experiment and not put ourselves in a position where we now have burdened ourselves with a budget that we can't afford. Right. right. We're already there on some level. Yeah. But that's part of the – and and that's different from, by the way, having an answer. You know, that's different from saying what is the right model for the right balance for our for our discount and our tuition and financial aid. This has to be thought of more holistically and experiment and revisit what is it that's working and where do we have to uh, double down in terms of putting more resources and what are some other areas we might need to scale back and ask those who are here – to, to step up even more than they already are. And I'm not discounting how much people are already doing. Uh, I'm sure some will hear this and say, you know, that's that's naive. Yeah, you oh, are insane. <laughs> I am insane. But well, I'm telling you I'm, something, I we're looking for that. the magic bullet. That's we right. are looking for the magic bullet in the right model. I mean, what's exciting about coming to this NBO conference is that people get the benefit of hearing other people's successes and giving them creative ideas. And what I'm saying is you don't have to wait for a conference like that to bring that concept to your leadership. Uh, and this is one way of doing it. This is a bit out of the box. But I tell you, I worked with a school that said, we're going to do this. We're going to grow enrollment and we're not going to increase our budget in a commensurate way. And and we're going to see what we learn from this and how what does it mean for us to still um, – provide the appropriate level of service. So that that's the that's one key concept. The second one I want to just speak to here that that's important I think for business officers is to recognize and also for heads of school to recognize the difference between cost cutting and revenue generation and that one thing to really keep in mind is that to to present new revenue ideas, you have to be prepared to say this is going to take probably three times as long to see the return on that investment. And when we try and sell these wonderful ideas to our to our leadership or to our boards, sometimes we don't paint a real picture of what it's going to take. So the question is, are you going to tell? Be, are you going to be honest about? what's really possible in the short term. It still might be the right thing to do. Sometimes we exaggerate the benefits because we are afraid if we don't, we won't get buy-in from those who have to sponsor it. The risk, though, is on the other side of it, we end up giving the impression that we're going to see these returns sooner than later. And there, there's that, that is a mistake that I've seen uh, made both in the independent school and higher ed community is that we don't set the right expectations for when the revenue ideas, the alternative revenue sources actually will come to fruition. It's about expectation setting uh, at, at the same time having a vision and saying, listen, you got to give me some time here. You got to be patient with this. This is I, I, I feel strongly that we can do this and – some of these ideas, by the way, because most of the people listening to this will be business officers and not heads, some of these ideas can come from you as opposed to waiting for the head or your president, if it's a higher institution, to come up with them or have that concept come from their seat. You know more about what are the different levers and drivers than anybody else in your institution, and there's an opportunity to raise those for your head and, and maybe even push for some of them. Oh, I love that. That's their superhero power. That's my kids they would say. I have seen some of the, they, they, you know, if you, if you unbutton their shirt, you can yeah. see that at the big S, they, yeah. they, but they hide it. They, they hide do. the superhero powers. They do. They don't we like to flaunt. Don't. 
Yeah. yeah. No. This is great because it really helps define the 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 sort of methodology underlying strategic growth. What does it mean to grow strategically? And that is to think about these complex issues. I think you've laid it out very very well. Find out more information about NBOA once again nboaannualmeeting.org, and uh, you can go there and look at uh, look at the uh, list of deep dives. I assume is coming soon. It, it has not been uh, completely fleshed out, but the schedule at a glance is there, and all the speakers are there, and so you can see what you have to look forward to at the uh, 2016 NBOA annual meeting, February 21st through 24th, Los Angeles. Uh, I'm sure this is not the last time we'll be talking about this as we lead up to the conference. Is that it, Howard? That's, that's it, That's Dave. the end? That's the end? That's it. That's the end. People, right. can go, people can go to lunch now. All right. Thank you, everybody, yeah. for downloading and listening to the show. On behalf of Howard Teibel, I'm Pete Wright, and we'll catch you next week on Navigating Change, the podcast from Teibel, Inc. Teibel, Inc.